Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Code Shakespeare Twelfth Night. Today we're going to look at Act 1, Scene 4. What I do in this series is I first give you a nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and pull out five or more quotes that I think are useful to help you understand the play's character, theme, and plot. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and if you make a donation, I'll send you a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. Act 1, Scene 4 is a short scene, but it's got some very important thematic character and plot elements that you should be aware of. We last encountered Viola way back in Act 1, Scene 2, when she was on the beach with the captain and she had told the captain that she was going to seek employment with Orsino, uh, disguised as a page boy. Um, she did that in order to, she wanted to do that in order to bide her time uh, while she figured out her situation in Aurelia, this strange world. Well, fast forward three days and she's speaking with Orsino's attendant, his name is Valentine, and she learns that after only three days, Orsino has become very fond of her. Now, thematically and in terms of character development, that's important, and we're going to talk about that today. Orsino tells Viola to visit Olivia to plead his case for her. Remember, we did learn that that um, Orsino is pining for the sheltered, the secluded, the fearful sleeping beauty Olivia, and he's going to ask Viola to go plead his case with Olivia. Viola is reluctant, but Orsino convinces her, arguing that Viola's youth and feminine countenance will persuade the timid, reclusive Olivia. Now, again, in terms of character development and theme, that's important because she is a sleeping beauty. She's hiding herself away from the world, and we'll see some more evidence of that today. Viola agrees, and reluctantly, as we've discussed, but admits in an aside that she herself is in love with Orsino, and bam, we've got comedic tension, and the plot is kicked into high gear. In terms of dramatic form, we are still at the beginning of the play, so we do need some more exposition, and we get it. We do learn, learn more about Orsino's noble character, um, primarily from the fact that Viola, he tells a story to, he tells his life story to Viola, and she falls in love with him because of that, which suggests that, uh, that, that he is indeed a noble character. Uh, we do get part of the exposition. We do get a complication to the, to the plot. Viola is in love with Orsino. He's in love with... Olivia, he thinks that Viola is a, is a young man, so complications galore. Uh, the, as I've mentioned, the, the main plot is set in motion. There is an action agreed upon to satisfy the need, the desire to resolve the conflict. Every dramatic enterprise needs some kind of problem that has to be solved. And so we have an action here that is t agreed upon to, to try to solve that problem. Now, many, many more complications ensue, but at least the ball has been set rolling. Orsino's pursuit of Olivia is the central main plot uh, complication, the main plot conflict. The subplots have their own problems. Act 1, Scene 4 opens with a conversation between Valentine and Viola, and Valentine is impressed indeed with Viola's performance, and he says, wow, it's only been three days, but Orsino really, really admires you, and if you keep this up, then you, your, your career here in Aurelia will be much advanced by the, by, by the Count. Now, Viola is, is a little bit worried by this. Remember, she's, she's in a vulnerable, vulnerable position. She's in a strange land with no friends, and she doesn't know who her enemies are, if she indeed has any. And she says, well, why, why, why are you mentioning his loyalties? Uh, is, is there a problem with his loyalties? Is he inconstant, sir, in his favors? And he says, no, believe me. Now, there's a couple of things revealed here. Is it, One thing that is revealed is Viola's Juliet-like intelligence, guardedness, and attentiveness to detail. She's smart. She's smart. She's in a strange land. She's vulnerable, and she's scoping out the situation, collecting information. Okay, so, so we've seen her do that already, and we're going to see her continue to do that. Whether or not she's manipulative and, and therefore a questionable character like Sir Toby, who is certainly manipulative, that's a question you can ask yourself. Um, certainly, ultimately not. Sir Toby's a horrible creature, and Viola's not quite, but she is manipulative. We have to admit that. But is she doing it for a noble purpose, for an excusable purpose? You figure that stuff out. The other thing that's revealed here is uh, it's more evidence that Orsino is indeed a, a good guy. He's noble. He's honest. He's, he, he does become the worthy hero. He's a narcissist at the beginning, uh, a self-centered kind of uh, adolescent figure, but he does grow. That's more evidence. Now, that alone is pretty thin evidence, but we've already seen it in several occasions. We're only in Act 1, to approach in the end of Act 1, but we've already encountered people speaking well of Orsino. Added to that, uh, Orsino then enters, and, and Orsino says, look, 
I have unclasped to thee the book even of my secret soul. So the last three days, we get the impression here that the last three days Orsino has been opening up his heart to Viola, partly probably because he naturally trusts her or he's stupid, but it turns out that Shakespeare builds evidence into the play to suggest that that Viola is indeed trustworthy. Uh, so Viola has had a good look at his character. She's heard several reports from her father, indeed, back in, in, in the early part of the act, from her father, from the captain, that Orsino's a good guy, from Valentine, who's the attendant, that he is a good guy. And so we have what Shakespeare, what Shakespeare's doing here is he's building verisimilitude. He's establishing Orsino as a noble, eloquent, honest character. He's a worthy hero eventually. It's verisimilitude. It makes it plausible that Viola would fall in love with him so darn quickly, do you see? Otherwise, it just sounds ridiculous and really, really cheesy. That eloquence uh, is important, I think, uh, because Viola, Viola wins the heart of Olivia with her eloquence as well. So, so that's part of being noble. It's, it's being able to speak well. I've opened up my heart to you. You know how desperate I am. Now go, you work for me, so go and argue my case to Olivia. Viola is reluctant to do this. She, she says, well, even if I do get to speak to her, what am I going to say? Orsino says, well, just tell her how passionate my love is for her. Added to that, though, is, is, is this. Olivia will attend your words better in thy youth than in annuncios of more grave aspect. If I send one of my messengers, who's a 35-year-old man with a big beard and furry eyebrows, to talk to Olivia, she's not going to respond as well. You're young and you're quite feminine. You're, quite, you're, you're, you're not threatening. You're not a big threatening man. You're a young boy. For they shall belie thy happy years that say that I are a man. If, if somebody says that you are a man, they are lying, do you see? Because you look like you're, you're, you're barely out of boyhood. Now that's important because uh, it, it, it reveals something of what I've been saying already in, in my theme video. If you go back and have a look at this in my theme and character video, uh, is that she is afraid of pain. She's afraid of pain from men. Her father died recently. Her, her brother died recently and she's gone into mourning, she says, for seven years. She's going to not talk to anybody, especially not men, because she wants to avoid pain. Now, that's a, that's a major theme. The time-wasting theme is, is, is something important that I've talked about already. So, so what's happening here is that the boy status of Viola uh, is, is a safe introduction to the potentially dangerous love. That's the boy band's phenomena. A 13-year-old girl uh, has romantic feelings, uh, but they're terrified of these big, scary, masculine men, and so they fall in love with these effeminate young boy bands. Boy, not man bands, boy bands, because it's a safe place to park their love, and that's what's happened. That's what, perhaps, that's what Orsino instinctively feels here, that that she's she's reclusive and she's timid, and so he sends uh, someone who doesn't look very threatening. Um, so that's certainly appearance versus reality, of course, the, and manipulation that may be excusable because Viola is indeed pretending to be that boy and she's not that boy at all. So the whole scene, there's dramatic irony here in this whole play, really, uh, of, of appearance versus reality and deception because Viola is deceiving everybody. Um, maybe Orsino's trying to trick and manipulate uh, 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 Olivia a little bit as well, but that's, that's, that's not uh, terribly um, salient uh, in this case. Uh, the theme of avoidance, of course, as I've already talked about, uh, Olivia is afraid of life. She's afraid of pain. She's afraid of men. She is the sleeping beauty that needs to be awoken. Uh, the same, in the same vein, it's love as potential destroyer, which it can be. Her love for her father and her brother destroyed her. It wrecked her emotionally, and that's why she's hiding herself away. Same thing, dual, dual, the dual nature of love. If you avoid the pain of love, you forego the pleasures of love. So right back to the time-wasting theme, which I should have included there, I suppose. You look like a girl, the implication being that you're not threatening, so go, do this job well, and you will prosper in my lands, says Duke Orsino. Viola agrees, and she says, I'll do my best to woo your lady. And then in an aside, she says, yet a barful strife, whoe'er I woo myself would be his wife. So there's the great romantic comedy plot complication. You got to have it. So there it is, uh, the announcement of, of, the, of the major main plot complication. It also, if we dig a bit more deeply into this quote that we see, uh, we, we see some stuff revealed about Viola that's important as well. She's selfless. She's stoic. She's noble. She's honest. Now, remember, she 
is in love with this guy, and yet she's going to another woman to try to convince the other woman to love this guy. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so that's, that's a stoic selflessness, and it's in sharp contrast to the selfishness and the narcissistic selfishness of Malvolio. Now remember, most art, if not all art, works by contrasts. If you want to accentuate the features of a particular theme or character, you've got to show its opposite to highlight the, 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 uh, uh, the other aspect of it. So for example, we are confirmed in Harry Potter's bravery by laughing at the silly kind of cowardice of Ron Weasley. That's how it works. Juxtaposition, character foils, contrast that's how it works and so we see here her stoic selflessness uh, um, reflecting well on her and reflecting badly on the uh, uh, on these other characters uh, so she does keep her word um, she doesn't she's honest she, she 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 says yeah sure I'll argue on your behalf and she does with all of her heart and 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 her eloquence and her and her own ingenuity and the energy she puts into convincing Olivia to love or see, you know, actually works against Orsino, which is quite ironic as well, too, because that eloquence and energy makes Olivia fall in love with her instead of Orsino. Anyway, so uh, it also demonstrates that she is the worthy hero. Uh, she has arrived in the wasteland Aurelia to cure it, and, and, and part of the way that she'll cure it is by calling, by being the Hagrid, being that call to adventure to everybody else, and she awakens everybody else uh, from their Sleeping Beauty slumber and into the realm of adventure, which in this case is not, you know, physical adventure. You're not slaying dragons here. Uh, you're not slaying literal dragons. You're slaying metaphorical dragons, all of the things that are keeping these people locked, emotionally locked in their cages. It's the call to love, the call to adventure, love being a tremendous adventure. She agrees to struggle on behalf of others rather than the self. There's the hero. And again, it contrasts with these other selfish characters. And that was Twelfth Night, Act 1, Scene 4. Come back for my next video when we'll finish up the act with Act 1, Scene 5. Thanks for watching.